We could not be more delighted to have with us tonight, Dr. Steve Smith. So before we get started, just a few logistical things. Most of you by now are probably pretty familiar with Zoom, but this is a webinar format. So tonight you will have both a chat button and a Q&A button. We hope that you will use the chat button to talk to us, talk to one another. My parent venture partner, Bev Hartman, will be putting resource links in the chat. So do check that out periodically. And then as the night goes on, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A button. We're going to be having about 40, 45 minutes of content tonight. And then we really want to hear from you, our viewers. So put your questions in the Q&A. We promise to get to as many of them as we can tonight. Um, I also want to call your attention to the Parent Venture Video Library, which is a free resource. Be my partner, again, Bev, is going to put that into the chat, the link to the video library. It is free. We have over 125 videos available. So if you like what you're seeing tonight, go there, check it out. All kinds of subjects from mental health to college admission to substance use, technology, digital media all kinds of topics of interest to parents today. So do check out the video library. All right, let me tell you a little bit about tonight's keynote speaker, Dr. Steve Smith. Steve Smith is a teaching professor and chair of the Department of Counseling, Clinical and School Psychology at UC Santa Barbara. He is the director of UCSB's Hosford Counseling and Psychological Services Clinic and teaches in the College of Creative Studies at UCSB. Steve is a consulting psychologist at Santa Barbara Middle School and also has a private clinical practice in Santa Barbara where he predominantly works with men and boys. He was trained as a clinical child psychologist at the University of Arkansas before completing an internship and fellowship in child and adult psychology at Massachusetts General Hospital and the Harvard Medical School. He served as director of consultation neuropsychology at Mass General before joining the faculty of UC Santa Barbara in 2004. Steve is a lifelong athlete and competitive runner. He lived in the Bay Area from 2014 to 2016. Steve was actually a co-board member with me at Challenge Success at Stanford, where he directed the PsyD program at the University of Palo Alto before returning to UCSB. He is also the proud father of two young children, athletes in the making. Please join me in a really warm virtual welcome for our friend and colleague, Dr. Steve Smith. Take it away, Steve. Uh, my very old computer couldn't handle all the monitors running at the same time. I got tried to get too fancy. I flew too close to the sun. Um, so hi, everybody. I appreciate you hanging with me through all the technical difficulties, but I'm really pleased and excited to be with you all tonight, talk about something that's really uh, exciting and I think an important topic and, and something that we can all sink our teeth into a little bit. Um, you know, like, like Charlene mentioned, my, my background is really broad and, and really varied. I'm a child clinical psychologist by background. I also specialized in, in clinical neuropsychology for a number of years, uh, and then also did work in grief and bereavement, for example. But while I was doing all of those things and being a, a psychologist in all these, uh, these interesting ways, I was also this guy. Um, I was a competitive cyclist for 25 years. And I started racing bikes when I was a wee lad of only 14 years old. I didn't get really serious about it until maybe after graduate school because that was the only first time I had ever had both time and money at the same time. I got pretty good at going up hills. Um, but eventually I developed a weird overuse injury that seems to uh, affect only elite cyclists as a vascular condition. And I had this big gnarly surgery uh, to try to fix it, but they couldn't quite put me back together. So I had to retire from bike racing. And then I started running. Um, and I did a lot of that for a while. And that was a lot of fun until I discovered trail running. And that's really where my heart lies to this day. Started doing ultra marathon trail running. So, you know, I had this background as a, as a psychologist, but that was also an athlete at the same time. And my interest in working with athletes actually came from trying to better myself as an athlete, or as we say in the business, research is me-search. As a cyclist, I was fit and I was skinny. I had a pretty good engine. I trained really hard. But I started getting notes back from my coach eventually where he would say, you know what? Your legs didn't lose you that one. And I thought, oh no, that's a psychology thing. I'm a psychologist to the library. 
Because when you're a psychologist, that's how you learn about people is you go to the library and you read about them. And so I started to read about performance enhancement stuff and like, how do we make athletes actually into better athletes? And what I found in picking through all that literature is that a lot of that performance enhancement work is, is a lot of garbage, quite honestly. If you teach people to visualize their performance, they get really good at visualization, but it doesn't seem to actually make them better athletes. If you teach people to have positive self-talk, they'll say nicer things to themselves, but their performance doesn't improve. What we can do is we can teach people how to tolerate suffering. Suffering physically, suffering emotionally, in terms of dealing with anxiety, with fear. You know, that was really helpful for me as an athlete. And so I started to get interested in working with other athletes too. So I went across the street, and it's literally across the street, to the Department of Athletics here at UCSB, the, the Gauchos, the Division I athletes. And I said, send me people. I want to work with some of your athletes. So the first person who came over was a thrower. Is a, a woman who was on track and field team and she was a thrower. She, she threw a hammer and, and shot put and all this stuff. She was huge. She had an anxiety disorder, pretty classic anxiety disorder. And she had difficulty talking with her friends and roommates and all these other things. And of course that affected her performance. I worked with a water polo player who was so insecure that he was getting into fights all the time. I remember he, he told me one time that someone cut him off in traffic and he ran up to the car he had and pulled them out and beat them up. I worked with a basketball player who hated that at just shy of seven feet, he couldn't blend in in any social situation. And he was really kind of a big introvert. I worked with a coach who had a team where it seemed like half of that team were functional alcoholics. And I learned that you have to be a masochist to play golf at all. And so really what I learned is that through all of this is that athletes need psychologists who understand the role of sports in their lives. But as humans, they grapple with the same complex panoply of mental health issues that everybody else does. And then on top of the stress of just being a human, they also needed to perform, often under substantial pressure. And that's one of the reasons we like sports, to see performance under pressure. And I'll talk about that again in a little bit. Being an athlete, especially a Division I athlete, can be repetitive and lonely and boring. It's a lot to ask. And if we attend to basic mental health needs, that has a substantial performance impact. Most psychologists who work with high-level Division I and professional teams are focused on the mental health of their athletes not the performance, because if you take care of the mental health, the performance often follows. Of course, I'm a child clinical psychologist at heart. So all of this stuff really got me interested in working with kids and sports. And research on kids and sports is really, really clear. Sports are great for kids. There are short-term and there are longer-term mental health benefits from sports, particularly team sports. Research shows that participation in youth sports is related to decreased rates of depression, decreased rates of anxiety, uh, and both decreased rates of depression and anxiety in adulthood, those, those, uh, the, those effects last. Increases the likelihood of having a healthier lifestyle across your lifespan, uh, better eating habits, less problems with drugs, uh, not less problems with alcohol, strangely. Um, participation in solitary sports like cycling and swimming and running tend to be uh, related to less positive outcomes than team sports, but still better than doing nothing, quite honestly. Now then, a lot of that stuff is really correlational. So it might be that the families who can support a kid in sports are actually a big protective factor. And the families that are too chaotic or too impoverished to do youth sports, we're going to have worse outcomes. Right? So there's, there's different things that be, could be causing that effect. It's hard to say sure, for sure. But the best research that we have suggests that sports are good for kids over the long haul. Now then, I've been kind of dismayed to see what has become of youth sports. And I think that we've all seen an increase in the professionalization of youth sports over the past 20 years. When I was a kid, most sports were things that you did in your backyard with your friends or your siblings. 
But now it's not uncommon for me to meet sixth graders who practice the same sport all year round and who are on travel teams and have private coaches and personal trainers and who are scheduled with showcases and camps and evaluations all to improve their performance or get them seen by people who can advance their athletic career. And I think we're starting to see some of the consequences of this. Okay, so now overall, we know that sports are good for kids, at least in a general sense. So let's talk about how it can go wrong. And the biggest hobgoblin here is specialization. So let's talk about specialization. And research on this is crystal clear. We've been studying this for 20 years and it keeps being the same. In most cases, kids should not specialize in one sport until they're about 13 or 14 years old. The specialization model that we're talking about here is characterized by deliberate practice activities on one sporting activity, defined as extrinsically motivated, focused on outcomes, often really not all that fun for kids. Uh, work-like manner where the kid shows up and runs drills and skills activities and all these other kinds of things. And so what we find is that kids who are early specializers are at risk for overtraining and injury. And this has been found to be true of tennis players, hockey players, baseball players, rugby players, kind of all the things. The American Academy of Pediatrics uh, issued a policy statement about the risks of high intensity training and discouraged specialization prior to puberty. They said that kids should participate in a variety of activities throughout childhood and limit sports to maybe only five or six days a week with a couple of days uh, rest in between. The American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons said no specialization prior to seventh grade. Because the excessive training or overload on a young body can result in damaging physical effects, including tissue breakdown, overuse injuries, such as tendonitis and stress fractures and tightness and rigidity, long-term growth disturbances, uh, growth plate damage, growth arrest or deformity of the long bones. The common finding is that intense and repeated training in a single sport at a young age corresponds with high rates of physical injury. You talk to any, um, uh, anybody who works in physical rehab and you ask them about the number of ACL tears that they're seeing in kids now versus 20 years ago, and it's completely different. And then also think about the head trauma research that we're, we're seeing coming out of football. In my practice now, I see a man who used to be a division one soccer player at a university far, far fancier than UCSB. And in high school, he played as a professional in Europe for a season. And he tells me of working with a private coach from the time that he was seven years old. And at this point, he's had at least six major surgeries on his hips, legs, and back. And as you grad after graduation from, from college, he tried to make it as a pro for a year. But the bone deformities in his hips from too much hard training at a young age were too debilitating. And at this point, he says he'd just be happy to be able to go and run around the block. He's 25 years old. This is not what we want. Sure, he had a great college career, but life is longer than that. Number two, research suggests that kids will burn out and drop out. Recent research has found that kids who specialize early tend to give up on sports by the time that they, that they go to college. Kids who participate in uh, sports and have fun doing so are much more likely to continue in sports across the lifespan. Uh, there's an emotional stress that goes along with the pressure. The pressure to perform leads to depression and anxiety. And kids who specialize early tend to have more social problems later on because their social circles are so limited. Research shows that if a kid is overscheduled in sports, it leads to increased stress in the family and often an increase in conflict in the parent's marriage. And it that may not be any different if your kid is overscheduled in piano or band or anything else, because variety is good and being overscheduled in things is not. There's even been some studies that found that the younger siblings will suffer a bit if they're always being dragged around for practice to practice. 
Early specializers are less likely to get college scholarships, at least those where sports performance tends to come later in life, which is pretty much all of them. They are not better athletes. So kids who are early specializers tend not to be better athletes over the long run. They are in the short run because they're, they're doing that a lot. But over the long run, they, that effect tends to wash out. And eventually they are surpassed by kids who play lots and lots of sports because they have developed all sorts of compensatory muscle uh, skills. Now then all of this is correlational evidence too. So maybe it's that kids who come from somewhat dysfunctional homes or who are prone to depression and anxiety tend to get really excited about a single sport. And maybe in some cases that's true. And when kids come from dysfunctional homes or poverty or other complex socioeconomic disadvantage, sports can serve as an important protective factor that will serve them well. But those aren't the kids I'm talking about here. Too often, the kids that I'm seeing are the ones who are trying to play a sport year round at a high level at a young age who feel substantial pressure to perform from their parents and coaches. But it's not quite that simple. So even if kids are doing a single sport a lot, it's important to understand what it is that they're doing. So you can think about the kinds of activities that your kids are doing in their sport programs that they're in now. So research has looked at what kids are doing in these specialization programs, and they, are, they have kind of divided things in half. One, there is the notion of deliberate practice, and this is skill-specific uh, activity, catching, throwing, fielding, running, doing things that are uh, practice drills or skill-based kind of things, right? Um, that they sort of look like this. There's like kids sitting around, there's an adult talking to them. There's like some kids sitting on a bucket. Like this doesn't look like any, any fun. But then there's deliberate play, which is something more like game simulation with or without adults present. They play basketball, they play baseball. Often kids will adapt the rules. Um, they will play with the rules. They will change the rules up a little bit. You know, this is the backyard baseball, the backyard soccer, the backyard football that a lot of us grew up playing. Now, the picture on the slide here, the deliberate play activity, I, I took this picture of a, of a bunch of kids playing soccer in Morocco. It's actually really hard to find Google images of kids just playing sports in their yards anymore because we have moved towards more and more structure in kids' activities. But when we give kids the opportunity to play a sport rather than practice a sport, they maintain their interest longer and will continue to grow in skills and abilities. I even remember working with Division I athletes. I remember um, working with uh, Division I women's soccer. And then this one soccer player said, I just wish a coach would just shut up and let us play soccer. Right? It's the love of the game that continues on rather than all these highly um, deliberate practice activities. So who are you? This is a philosophical question posed to us by Pete Townsend and, Ro and Roger Daltrey. And really what I wanna talk about here is identity and child identity development. And we all develop a sense of identity throughout childhood and really for the rest of our lives. And their sense of ourselves continues to grow and change across time. What we find is that kids tend to be relatively concrete about these things, especially little kids. Little kids will define themselves with the things they like to do, the things they wear, roles they play. And you ask a little, little, uh, little kid, who are you? They say, well, I'm, I'm the fastest boy. I like to wear shirts with unicorns on them. I have brown hair. They'll describe themselves in pretty concrete terms. Middle schoolers will tend to continue to define themselves in a way that they are either like or not like other kids because um, uh, the peer relationships become much more important during those years. I'm a soccer player. I have a lot of friends. I know a lot about mollusks. I'm nice. I'm smart. I like math. This is kind of middle schooler sorts of things. But it's really not until late adolescence that kids develop a sense of self that is based on a system of values, future goals, or internal experiences. I'm compassionate. I appreciate nature. I'm a good friend. My family is important to me. I have a lot of integrity. I want to go to college. So these are the kinds of things that you hear people saying later on in, uh, in adolescence. Now, the one thing that helps us deal with 
uh, setbacks is a strong sense of identity couched within a social with a within a supportive social network. For all athletes, we have a sense that being an athlete is central to our identities. That's true for me, and that's truly probably true for many of you as well. But when we lose that, or it's threatened, or if we don't have something else to fall back on, it's a real struggle. For many young athletes, they've not had the time or space to develop a sense of identity that's complex enough to handle the pressure of sports that we start to dump on them. And as sports become more and more professionalized at early ages, kids don't have a strong enough sense of self to support it. It's like putting more and more weight on a shaky bridge. Eventually, it will break down. And that's what we saw with Simone Biles just a handful of months ago in the Summer Olympics. Simone Biles' name is nearly synonymous with women's gymnastics. And when our identity gets yoked to our performance, a bad performance essentially means that we are failures and competition is a direct threat to who we are. Simone Biles introduced most of us to the, to the idea of the twisties, which essentially means the getting lost in space during gymnastics metaphors. And it's a wonderful metaphor for how she must have felt. And much has been written about Simone from athletic and culture and gender perspectives. So it's clear that the twisties have kind of landed on us culturally in an interesting way. And this is why research is so clear that waiting a while before we put kids into high pressure sports is better for them emotionally, physically, and even in their performance. Without a complex sense of self, their systems of coping, the systems of coping are just too fragile to deal with it. And this is true for all things. If I only think of myself as a good student, then a B on a math test is devastating. If I only think of myself as a piano player, then a bad recital is devastating. Disappointment is fine. Disappointment is fine and it's appropriate, but I'm talking about devastating to a sense of self. It's a deeper level. Research is also clear that athletes with a complex sense of self are also less likely to choke under pressure. They're better athletes. If I only think of myself as a basketball player, this next free throw means so much more than if I also think of myself as a good friend, compassionate thinker, math whiz, or top-notch pumpkin grower. And the more we expose ourselves to a threat to our identity, the more we feel anxious and less likely to perform well. And younger children just have less complex senses of self. So this is one of my favorite quotes. And I, I, um, the human being should be able to change a diaper, plan an invasion, con a ship, design a building, write a sonnet, balance accounts, build a wall, set a bone, comfort the dying, take orders, give orders, cooperate, act alone, solve equations, analyze a new problem, pitch manure, program a computer, cook a chasey meal, fight efficiently, die gallantly. Specialization is for insects. I love this quote because people need to be well-rounded. Children need to be well-rounded. It's what makes good citizens. You notice that getting into a good college is not on this list. Good college in quotes, because that's a, that's a mythology for a different talk. And so when I talk to parents about their kids, this is a phrase that I use, that really what you want to have is a horizontal kid. That in order to be resilient, the child needs to have a diversified portfolio of things that make them feel good and healthy, interested and engaged. So, to have interests that are broad and varied. It doesn't mean that they need to perform well in any of these things. They just need to have interests. Vertical kids are kids who have all of their identity wrapped up into one or two things, like getting into a good college or being an athlete. In the face of failure and setback, research suggests that horizontal kids will do better. Peer relationships, special interests, goals, interesting musical tastes, Faith and spirituality are just being a good and kind human being who cares about other human beings. That's so much better for mental health than just about anything. So here's some real life quotes that I've heard from real life people. Uh, mom came to me and she says, I think you can help my daughter improve her soccer game. I don't think she's playing to her potential. I said, well, how old is she? She just turned eight. Kid uh, says this, if I quit volleyball, I'm not sure what else my dad will talk to me about. 
uh, her dad says, yeah, but Brian, who's nine years old, is really talented at tennis. Tennis, And the talented thing always gets me. If your kid is 16, then maybe you can talk about talent. Maybe. But until then, you have development. You have differences in developmental trajectory. I was the tallest kid in class in fourth grade. On a good day, I'm five foot eight. Some people don't reach physical maturation until their mid-20s. Be careful of the word talent. Mom says this, on Monday, Wendy, Wendy, who's 12 years old, has piano and swimming. On Tuesday, she had swimming and math. On Wednesday, she has math and dance. Parental mental health is not an unlimited commodity. We have to take care of the whole system. Okay, so what I want to talk about here is, is the difference between why we like sports and why we like sports for our children, because those are different things. Well, why is it that we like to why is it that we like to watch sports? Well, we enjoy seeing highly skilled people at the pit of their fakeness doing amazing things that are very hard. We appreciate the emotional roller coaster of wins and losses and ups and downs. We like the connection with other fans. Sports fandom also gives us a sense of identity, uh, particularly people who really like sports. But why do we like sports for our kids? Well, it should be fun. In fact, having fun is the number one reason that kids like playing sports. We have research on this. There is actual research that says, we went out, if you went out and asked children, why do you play sports? Kids said, because it's fun, dummy. And the number one reason that kids quit playing sports, it stops being fun. We want it to be fun. But it also teaches them all these valuable life lessons about teamwork, about health, about being in nature, perseverance commitment. It teaches them about both winning and losing well and dealing with adversity. Now, they can learn those things in a lot of other ways, through dance, music, church groups, scouts, going on family hikes. And the reason that they can learn those things in other ways is because those are process factors, not outcome factors. They're experiential, not performance. We like to watch sports largely because of the performance. We want our kids to be in sports because of the process. Those are different things. And kids suffer when they can't tell the difference, or especially when parents forget the difference. Indeed, when I work with high-level athletes, I often have them tell me about how they fell in love with their sport. And, how, and they often talk about having fun with their friends, about being outside, about eating orange slices. Baseball guys always have a story about playing catch with their dads or their grandfather or Uncle Joe. Getting them to remember the process and the experiential aspects of why they do their sport and focus less on their performance tends to improve their performance. And it also improves their emotional well-being and their coping and reduces their anxiety. Anytime that any of us lose ourselves in the pursuit of a particular outcome without sufficient attention to the process, it takes an emotional toll. Back when I was still racing bikes, I was really focused on my race outcomes in order to move up in categories. There's all these categories in, in, in bike racing. I was always trying to move up in categories. When I was focused on my race outcomes in order to get points to move up in category, I got pretty miserable a lot of the time and actually started to not enjoy the process. And when I give talks about performance to business groups, I get them to focus on being in the process too. Because once we start to focus on process, we enjoy ourselves a little bit more. The writer David Foster Wallace says that if you worship power, you will always fear feeling weak. If you worship intellect, you will always fear being seen as stupid. If you worship beauty, you will always feel ugly. And I'd add that if you worship performance, you're always going to be at risk of feeling like a failure. With early specialization and an increased pressure on kids to perform, the focus starts to be more on the performance rather than the process. Kids run the risk of feeling that their value is tied to a given outcome. So failure means that they're worthless. Pressure from coaches and parents, teachers, social media can really mix a kid up and turn sports from being a great experience 
to another source of stress, anxiety, humiliation, and threat. In the same way, that focusing only on grades in school takes away the joy of learning and education and becomes more about performance for a particular outcome. In order to, for kids to reap the benefits of sports, we need to keep it fun. We need to vary it up. We need to focus on process. This doesn't mean we need to avoid having winners and losers. That's fine. That actually teaches a kid perseverance and what they're good at and not good at. If we only focus on winning and losing, that's not great. So here's some more, here's some more quotes. Um, D1 college athletes said, college baseball has made me hate baseball. 11 year old says this, I hate basketball, but if I tell my mom that I want to quit, she'll be mad. Pro athlete says this to me, if I can't make it as a pro, I will consider my entire life a failure. Parents says this, we've invested too much money to have her quit tennis now. 16 year old says this, I just need a break. I'm so tired of early morning practices and then school and then another practice and then tutoring on the weekends. We travel and stay in a hotel for tournaments. I'm sick of it. This is a, I, I heard this just a handful of weeks ago and one of, and finally I worked with this kid to help her have the courage to tell her parents that she didn't want to play her sport anymore. Division one baseball coach said this to me, if parents would put all the money they spend on camps and private coaches and into an ETF or 529 plan, they wouldn't need to worry about a scholarship. The other thing he said to me too, is that he prefers to pr recruit multi-sport athletes because they're less likely to break down and get injured along the way. Okay, so let's, let's have some tips. So, if we see the professionalization of youth sports amplifies performance over process, and early specialization amplifies performance over process, if we want our kids to reap the benefits of sports, we need to focus on the process and help them develop a complex and diverse sense of themselves. So what do we do? Well, one, have a horizontal kid. Really work with your child to have them be more horizontal. Identity should be arranged about around a lot of things. Playing sports is great. I encourage that for all, all your kids. But they should also enjoy learning. They should also learn how to be a good friend. They should learn how to enjoy art and creation. Knowing how to manage their down, downtime. Being compassionate, being respectful, having a complex sense of self. If something goes wrong, then they'll have something to fall back on. Uh, I worked with a pro athlete who told me that he didn't like his sport. He didn't like his sport at all. But because he never did well in school, it was all he had. He was vertical. And a kid who is too vertical around anything will lack flexibility. This is also uh, true for kids who only do school, only do piano, only do computer games. Balance leads to resilience. Know the kid you have. The kid you have is not the kid that you were. Listen to them. My five-year-old daughter just learned how to ride a bike without training wheels. And there I am, 25 years of bike racing under my belt, going, here we go. That's not my kid. I have to listen to her. I have to listen to what she tells me. The kid I have is not the kid I was. Encourage the fun and the play. That's gonna keep them involved for a lifetime. Remember, when we talk about youth sports, what we want to encourage is a lifetime of health. There's nothing magic about team sports or organized sports in general. Remember that we're after health and a lifetime of activity here. A kid at a skate park who or who likes hiking is no less of an athlete than a kid on a basketball team. And apart from one season of t-ball, I've never played an organized team sport as a kid. I would have hated that. But I'm a 48-year-old man. I run 75 miles a week because I find things that have worked for me and has led to a lifetime of activity. Remember the kid that you have. Find ways to support the things that are their passions. This is completely arbitrary, but I made up a two-hour rule. You don't talk to your kid about a game or a practice for at least two hours afterwards. I made that up, 
But a lot of kids will tell me that they don't want to talk to their parents about that. If you feel compelled to say something to them, say, I like watching you play. Let me keep your mouth shut. I've worked with division, I worked with a division one athlete who used to hide in the bathroom after her games because she didn't want to have to talk to her family about that. Don't be that family. Get some exercise. <clears throat> You're the model here. Get outside and breathe some fresh air. Your kids don't need any more exercise than you do. And in fact, that actually may be the opposite. We need to model for our children a lifetime of health so that they will emulate us and grow in healthy activities across the lifespan. Treadmills are for running, not for living. And they're not even really for running, they're for torture. Your kid's life shouldn't feel like a treadmill. If they choose to live like that later on, that's fine, that's their choice. But kidding, putting kids on a race to nowhere is not a way to live. And so remembering to focus on the process variables and the things that make life enriching rather than some distant outcome to aim for. Focus on the experience, not the outcomes. Failure and boredom are great things. Failure teaches a kid where they are competent and how to improve. It teaches perseverance and grit. Boredom is good. I'm a fan of boredom because it teaches self-sufficiency and encourages creativity in both good and bad ways. Don't be afraid to have your kid be bored. Sports are great if we remember the values, right? So uh, a lot of times when I give this talk, I often feel like I'm, I'm, I'm talking down youth sports and I'm not, I think they're great. I'm a fan of youth sports, but only if the focus is on teaching and living in a system of values. If we teach the values, remember what it is that you want your kids to learn. And remember that specialization is for insects. Reduce the pressure, teach what you value, and the rest is gonna take care of itself. Okay, thank you so much. Charlene. Thank you so much, Steve. You've given us so much to think about. I've heard you give this talk before, but I hear something different every time I just, Love that advice about having a horizontal kid, so important, right? Especially as our children and teens are developing their identities. So Steve, why did you decide to become a competitive athlete? Why not just run or bike for your own health and enjoyment? It's a great question. And I, I think um, I once had an athlete say, say something to me like, is all competition based in insecurity? And I said, yeah but that's okay. That I think on some level, there is this desire to, to prove something. Um, and I think that there are healthy ways to be competitive and there are ways to be competitive that I think are a little destructive. So when I hear athletes talking about wanting to see how good they can be, wanting to uh, maximize their genetic potential, wanting to, um, to experience the, uh, the excitement of playing in national competitions or playing at the highest level, that it's really based on experience. And I, I think those things are really, really good. Um, when I hear athletes talking about competition as, um, as wanting to win, like I, all I do want to do is win, or um, actually competing in a sense of anger. I've heard it, endurance athletes saying things like, uh, I, like, I had to go catch that guy because he was trying to take something from me. Like That can be incredibly motivating in the short run, but I think you know, that person has to go home. That person has to go home and then try to have relationships with other people. And I'm not sure how well that, that plays out. But for me, um, it, it was always about wanting to prove something to myself about where I could take this. Like, how far can I go with this? What is the next level? And kind of getting excited about what that experience was going to be. But when I started to focus on just those outcomes, I got, I got pretty cranky. All right, here's a question, Steve, that is such a good one. We have some really great questions coming in, everybody. Keep them coming. When do you allow your child to quit a sport versus encouraging them to persevere through challenges? That's, that's, that's a great question, and it depends upon the age of the kid. I, for middle schoolers and above, you say you want to do a thing, you finish a thing. Um, 
Yeah, you know, and even in, you know, it depends, and of course, everything that I say is contingent upon the child you have. And so, you know, what I would say is that, you know, fifth, sixth grade, they need to honor those commitments. I think it teaches them some good things. Really anything less than that, nah, they, they don't need to do that. I mean, I, I, sometimes you can encourage them to go like one more week. You know, I think that's fair, but if they really don't like it and they're starting to have a lot of anxiety about it, it's just not, it's just not worth it. I think so. Yeah, I, I do think that there is something really important about uh, encouraging the perseverance and the honoring of the commitment. Like you made a commitment to the team, to the coach, to to me, your parent, to the money that we just paid for this. But I mean, this, is a, this is a long game. It's just a really long game. And so allowing them to quit if they're younger, I think, is really good. If they're older, encouraging the hang on. I think that's fine. Okay, fair enough. Steve, what, um, here's another great question. What should a parent or student do if they get a coach who's a bully? It's, it's such a good question. And what I would say is quit immediately. <laughs> I mean, um, one of the most heartbreaking things I had to deal with once um, in, uh, as, a, as a psychologist, is I had a 16-year-old athlete come to me and she was on a team and the coach was a monster like everything that, that I heard that she said that the coach said to her was horrific but she hung in there because he knew division one coaches and she was expecting that he would be able to grease the skids for her to get a scholarship and and I said to her and I said to her mom I don't think this is worth it I don't think it's worth it to deal with a coach who is beating you down and we're, you know, seeing things coming out of the media that that goes all the way up. There's abusive coaches all the way up. And, and I just don't see the positives of hanging in there with that. So if it's, a, if it's a coaching organization and there's a leadership structure above that, you can go to the leadership structure. But I think in the end, like you wouldn't let your child be abused by anybody else for any other reason. I mean, I mean it's just like, just because they happen to be a coach and maybe even because they win games, you just wouldn't let you just wouldn't let somebody abuse your child. And so I think those kinds of situations, you, you need to weigh the cost benefit analysis, but I would not hesitate to pull a kid out for that kind of reason. That makes sense, Steve. I know that those young athletes, um, Simone Biles and her friends, if people had only just listened to them a little bit better, right? Mm -hmm. That's right, yeah. Okay, here's another question that I think many parents of athletes can uh, relate to. What is the best way to support teens who get nervous before games? Well, it depends about how nervous, right? Getting nervous before, before games or competitions is normal. That's what you, you kind of want that on some level because it means you care. We get anxious about things that we care about. And there's, there's a nice curve that shows optimal level of anxiety. And if you have too much, you don't perform well. And if you don't have enough, you don't do well enough. Right? So you want optimal anxiety in there. But my, my hunch is that the question is about like, like really gnarly anxiety. And you know, I, I think in, in those sorts of situations, first of all, that actually might be a good experience for that kid to learn to tolerate some of that anxiety because may, because if it's happening in sports, it's often happening before tests and things like that too, at least in my, in my clinical experience. I'm like, okay, well, where else are you getting that anxiety? Um, you know, uh, I mean, there, there, are a few, there are a few ways that, that you, can, you can deal with that. One is just helping them have some perspective. Like, just a basketball game like you're not this isn't like you're not performing surgery here and and so offering them a little bit of perspective i think can be really helpful the other thing um th that i do with athletes who get really anxious i just tell them i just say tell me everything you're really worried about okay let's, let's just put them right out there and let's just get them down uh, when I was working with the D1 crowd, I would have them text me all the things that they were afraid were going to happen. And I would, like every weekend, I would get this big long list of like terrible things that could happen to people. Like, I'm going to blow out my hamstring. I'm going to fall down, like whatever it is. And it would just come from like five or six different athletes. Um, so you can kind of download your anxieties like that. And that's one way to kind of move them off. Um, but, I, you know, I think... Um, there, there are also cases where it, it really becomes quite crippling uh, and the, the child isn't able to sleep or to focus or to do well in school. Um, 
I've worked with athletes and before every competition, they have to go and throw up. I mean, it's that level of anxiety. I think you, you might want to take a close look at and see where else it's coming up um, in that child's life and, and think about maybe a little bit more comprehensive intervention at that point. Okay, good advice. Thank you, Steve. So we have a couple of questions coming in around your comments on specialization. So I'm going to start kind of at one end and then move to the other. Okay. Here's a good question. Parent says, our kid is very non-specialized, but she still focuses so much on outcome. How can we help? Um, well, that's a really good question. It's a really good question. I, I would, so, so part of it, I think, is just in the water, and I think it's in the water where many of you live, in terms of having being in um, in communities that are also that are also focused on performance in a lot of different ways. And so, I think reminding reminding the children what it, the kids what is the what are the values here? What's really important? What's the most important thing? And the other thing that I would do is, is kind of watch your language, watch how you're talking about it, watch how you're talking about outcomes and, um, and the performance. And you know, don't go to every practice, don't go to every game, sort of check, pull back a little bit and help that kid remember who they are. But I think some of that is also sort of culturally present in the, in the, in the place that you live. And so that's, that's a trickier one, I think. But you know, I think as long as you, the message that you send is really consistent about, well, how was that? What'd you learn out there today? What was fun about it? Right? Asking the questions about the experience rather than the process, you're sending an alternative message. It's not going to cure anything overnight, but it, it maybe will help to begin to change that narrative a little bit. So in a related way, Steve, this is kind of the other end of the spectrum that you've been talking about. This is a long question, but I'm going to read bits of it, OK? Uh, parent says, I totally believe what you're saying about specialization and professionalization, but the world we live in is very competitive. And while we try to show our kids other sports, the reality is that youth sports are really year round and consuming. What can we do? How do we handle that without withdrawing, given that our kids love to play and want to play at a high level? So sort of the others, and like you were just saying, when the pressure is sort of there to do it and the kid kind of wants to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, my heart goes out to you. I, I think that's right. I think um, the world we live in is competitive. I'm not sure I would agree with that. I, I think we have the, we have the feeling that the world is more competitive. I'm not entirely certain that it is. Um, it's like college admission rates are pretty steady the past 20 years. But anyway, so, I, you know, I think we have a sense that the world is more competitive. Um, uh, and if the kid wants to play a sport all year round, I think that's, I think that's, they can make that choice at a certain point, but I think you have to, you have to, have to give the alternative message. And I, and what I tell parents of younger kids is don't play the game. Don't play the game. You're the master of your child's destiny, at least in, during these years. And if, if you have to anger a club coach every now and again, because you're like, no, you know, I'm going to pull the kid out and we're going to do swimming or we're going to just take a semester off from doing sports. It might make your kid real grumpy there for a little while, but they can pick something else to do. And I think you can give them a menu of things like, well, you can do, you can do another sport, but you need to take a little time off from soccer. Um, and I just, I just wish that I had something to give to parents that parents could show their children that says, you will be a better athlete you are more likely to become a professional athlete or a division one athlete if you play multiple sports. And we have so much data that says that that's true. But that data and, and, and the research on that is, runs really contrary to the club sport machine. The club sport machine makes money by keeping kids in, in it all year round. You know, that's kind of how capitalism works, right? But the research on this is really clear that if you have kids do lots of different things, you will be a better athlete the more things that you do. And like, I, just, I just wish I had something to give to parents that would show their, their kids that that's true. Well, here's a comment, and this is actually a book that I have on my bookshelf. It is a parent comments, the book, What Made Maddie Run, The Secret Struggles and Tragic Death of an All-American Teen is a good read for parents 
and really helps to understand the concept of identity. Yeah, it's a tough read, but it's a new book, newish book, and it really takes you inside the life of one teen playing one sport at a very high level for a very high end university. Literally her text messages are on there. And yes, it's heartbreaking because she ends up taking her life, but it shows you the pressure that she was under to keep everybody happy, keep her family happy, keep her coach happy. And in the end, she just couldn't make the choice to quit. So, okay, related question, Steve. When should my kids see a sports psychiatrist or a psychologist like you? Immediately. Um, no, I, I don't know. I mean, so well, uh, again, I, I, um, I tend not to use this, the word sports psychologist for, for myself unless it, unless it helps get a kid in my door. Um, but I'm, a, I'm a psychologist who works with athletes. And I really, that's how I think about the work. And, and if you're looking for someone to work with your kid, uh, I would worry less about the sports part than about the child part, because um, I think often people who build themselves as sports psychologists will really focus on that sports part, and they can actually make the problem a whole lot worse. And so what you want is somebody who takes a look at your, your child's whole life, their entire functioning, their friends and the relationships and the family and all those sorts of things, and really understands the role of sports in, in that area. And in terms of when to when to contact, I, I think when when the anxiety is really high uh, and the kid is is really suffering because of it and seems to be suffering with anxiety before before games, before competitions, before practice, they're losing sleep. If you see that their friendships are, are dwindling, those kinds of things, it, the kind of things that you would pick up on on normally. I think that's when you try to find a, a psychologist or mental health professional who understands the role of sports and understands the meaning of that and how, how great and wonderful that can be for kids, but can also have the perspective to see the whole child. All right. And so we have just a few minutes together, Steve, but I want to finish with this question because I really do think in the communities where many of us live, this really is a big part of the problem. Parent says, you mentioned not specializing, but it seems like college admissions want superstars in something, academic sports, et cetera. How do we keep a horizontal kid when colleges want specialized students? Yeah, we think that, right? I mean, we think that. And so um, uh, prior versions of this talk, when I talk about the mythology of a division one athlete, it's like a, not a thing, that, or division one scholarship, it's not a thing that happens. That, that if you actually look at uh, college admissions counselors and the ratings of things that they find important, you know, playing a sport is, is kind of underneath community service, right? It, like they want to know that your child, you know, they like they like diversified portfolios too. They want to know that your kid has done a lot of things, and that they're interesting and and all of that. Sports doesn't need to be part of that, and high level sports doesn't need to be part of that either. I think if you have a kid who's well rounded um, and uh, is is well adjusted, like okay, there's going to be a there's going to be a college for them, right? And again, the the mythology of what is a good college, I think, is is a myth that we all need to take a take a look at. Really good. I just finished a book called Valedictorians at the Gate by Becky Sabke. And her point is she was an admission director at Dartmouth. And she said, just what you just said, we really want diversified kids. And if more students really knew that, the better off they would all be. OK, Steve, we've talked about horizontal kids. Specialization is for insects. Any final words, Dr. Smith, for us? It has been a pleasure. I think, think I'm good, Charlene, thanks. All right, well, listen, thank you everybody for being with us tonight. Again, thank you to Rita Allen and the Fremont Union High Schools Foundation for your support of this program and this event tonight. The video has been recorded and will be available soon on our video library. That link is in the chat. Thank you everybody so much for coming tonight. Great to have you all. Take care, stay well, and go play some sports. Thank you tonight, Dr. Steve Smith. Good night, everybody. Good night.